Okay, we're here today for the video oral history of the Honorable Andrew Hurwitz. My name is Rita Hausler. Your Honor, it's a pleasure having you here today. Oh, Thank you to so here. much for your time. I'd like to hear a little bit about your early life. Where did you, where did you, where were you born, and where did you get started? Uh, I was born in a small town called New York City, uh, okay. where all my family lived. When I was three years old, my dad moved out to a place called Booton, New Jersey, uh, where he opened a men's clothing store, and my uh, that's where I grew up in a, a small town of about eight thousand people. Uh, at the time, you know, we didn't understand what a wonderful place it was. Small, everybody knew each other. When you got in trouble, somebody, somebody's family called and your parents came. And I had great friends and a great childhood in that place. Uh, uh, went from there to Princeton, where I was an undergrad. Uh, and then after four years at Princeton, uh, probably the most important thing that happened there was I met my wife. And we got married right after graduation. And then we went to New Haven, uh, where I went to law school and started a family with, uh, with Sally. Okay. Uh, and when you say New, New Haven, you went to Yale? Went to Yale Law School. Uh, it, at Yale, it took some time off because I had military service. Uh, but we were in Connecticut for the next six years. Uh, the law school uh, clerkship with a district judge, John Newman, who later became the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals. Uh, I was his first law clerk, and so I had a wonderful experience there. Clerk for a judge on the Second Circuit, and then ended up clerking for Potter Stewart on the Supreme Court. So I had the world's longest series of clerkships. I ran out of courts. If there was another court to go to, I would have. Uh, yeah. And you sort of have done that now, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it, I've run out of courts now, too, I think. Uh, but I had a, um, if, if you go back, I had. As I think was typical of the time, uh, wonderful parents, neither of whom had gone to college, both of whom today would have gone to college and been uh, very successful professionals and therefore valued education very highly. It was clear that both my brother and I were either going to be doctors or if we failed at that, we would be lawyers. Uh, and when I got to college, I, I took a course in constitutional interpretation and decided that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, you don't know at that age that really you're not going to be doing constitutional interpretation for a living, but I became very interested in law and, uh, and sort of put aside the notion that I was going to become a doctor, uh, perhaps to my parents' uh, distress, but they were later happy <laughs> about my career choices. And strangely enough, my brother is a a lawyer also, uh, <laughs> outside of Philly, a very successful lawyer, and we both took s different ways the same career path. Okay, so it's really a class in, at Princeton that inspired well, you yeah, to it was, it was that and sort of, uh, I would, did very well in the sciences, but I wasn't passionate about them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I sort of realized early on that, that while well, I could do that stuff, it wasn't what I really was interested in. And I took a class from uh, one of the great political scientist uh, constitutional scholars named uh, Alpheus Mason, who was very mm -hmm. famous at the time. And the class was just fascinating. And we would write opinions. And I was, I, I was able to take it as a sophomore, even though it was a junior and senior class, and I did very well. And, uh, and it opened all sorts of things in my, in my mind about, about other ways that I might, I might succeed other than being a doctor. And so it, it, that was probably the first push along the way. I didn't know very many lawyers growing up. Small town, you know, the local lawyers did wills and, and automobile accidents, and what they did didn't seem all that interesting to me. Uh, but I, this is the first time I, I saw that lawyers did something more. They, they affected public policy. They, they changed the way the country worked. And that was, a, that was an eye-opener for me. Yeah, no, that is different. When you were in at both either at Princeton or at Yale, I don't know if community service or pro bono was, was something you were involved in or it was even possible. Yeah, it, well, it was, although it had different names then, I think. So what, at Princeton, uh, one of my mentors at Princeton, and it's remarkable, I'm still in touch with him mm -hmm. weekly, uh, was, my, was one of my advisors named Jim Doig, who was very much involved in community policing issues. 
Uh, we had a seminar there about policing, and a whole bunch of us got involved in issues. So he, I worked for the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs during the summers. Um, did a did a project with him, a, a Ford Foundation project, Model Cities grant for New Brunswick along the way, where we were trying to help them with community policing. And so, in those days, it, for college students, it wasn't called pro bono work. Uh, it was. Yeah, it was just unusual that you would work in, in, a, in other capacities and not get paid, but I did. In law school, um, I, I had a family, <laughs> and so I worked, but I worked at a law firm, a marvelous little law firm in New Haven that tried cases all the time, and the lawyers took me to court with them. Uh, they, they would, I'd prepare witnesses with them, I'd go to court with them, I'd sit through the examinations. Uh, I'd go to the jail and help them interview the guy who was in jail. Uh, and I had a full-time job there while I was doing all the stuff at law school. So there were, there were opportunities in law school to do pro bono work, but I was doing, uh, we needed to make some money to take Absolutely. care of the family, particularly once my wife got pregnant and had, a, had to sit out her job in those days. So not much of it in law school, lots of it in private practice. Uh, okay, so let's go back to community policing because that's obviously a very, hot topic these days. You know, what was the goal of the... Well, the goal was, and it was, it's, 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 it's a continual goal that people talk about today even. If you, can, if you can make police part of the community that they work in, and to take the simplest example, mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in this little town. Um, after the kid in Ferguson got, uh, kid got in Ferguson, Missouri got killed, um, one of the nice things about email and Facebook is all your old friends are still in touch with you. And we were in town with very few African Americans. And one of the guys sent an email to uh, uh, the African American kid who I grew up with and said, well, what would have happened to you if you walked down the middle of the street in Booton, New Jersey? And he said, the cop would have said, Harold, I'm going to call your mother if you don't get back on the sidewalk. And, and I thought that was, you know, it was funny, and, uh, but it, it's really what community policing was about. The notion that somebody was embedded in the community, he wasn't an occupying force. He understood the, the difference between technical violations, drinking beer on the front step, and, and things that threatened the community. Uh, and in, in many ways, you keep hearing police chiefs talking about it again. Uh, we have a very good police chief in Phoenix who's, who's who's talking about returning to those days. And what we've seen, I think, I don't know how to, how to stop it, we've seen a militarization of police forces. We've seen them become more and more like the Army and less and less like the community service organizations that, that they, were, they ought to be properly designed as. So we worked a lot on that. Um, the Vera Foundation in New York uh, was, was very instrumental in, in funding that stuff. Um, several of my colleagues uh, in law school and from that seminar have gone on to careers sort of thinking about those issues and dealing with those issues. Uh, so we, that, that, that course that we took was really a transformative one for a lot of us. And as always taught, you know, because it was taught by a wonderful professor who I said I, I still get emails from it. Once, once or twice a week uh, about various topics. Yeah. Uh, I, I moved away from that stuff in law school somewhat because the, the options weren't as available. Um, but it was a, really a marvelous experience. Yeah, and very necessary and obviously still necessary, so. Well, and so we're still, we're still struggling with what's the, you know, how much are police doing law enforcement, how much are they doing crime prevention, and where's the line between the two of them? And it's a very difficult job for uh, my, you know, we have very close family friends who are police members, so I, I, I wouldn't want their job. But I think at some level, somebody outside the day-to-day -day grind has to be thinking about what the appropriate roles are and how it is that we, how it is that we make communities safe. And that's what people were thinking about in, in the late 60s and they're still thinking about. Absolutely. So when, once you graduated from Princeton, you had a family, and yet you start on a series of clerkships that you mentioned earlier. How did that come to pass? Well, mostly episodically. Uh, so, you know, it, it, at Yale, at least, it was the notion was you ought to try to get a clerkship if you can get one. And I had a clerkship with Judge Smith on the Second Circuit, 
Uh, because of my military service, I got out in January, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, June. And John Newman had just gotten appointed to the district court in Connecticut, and he called me up. He called the dean and said, do you have any students that are available right away? And the dean said, oh yeah, Andy Hurwitz and three other people graduated in the middle of the year. Mm -hmm. And he called me up and said, would you like to do this? And I was going to go to work at this law firm until my clerkship began. And uh, what, what is sort of these wonderful things that happen by, by happenstance? Uh, John Newman is, uh, uh, if he's not the smartest man in the world, he knows the smartest man in the world. A wonderful judge a very thoughtful guy and brand new on the bench. Mm -hmm. And so we began this thing together. We were only like 15 years apart in age. Uh, and, and he was a very experienced trial lawyer and a very thoughtful guy, but we, he did things like when we started, there'd be an objection, he turned to me and say, okay, wise guy, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> and then he, of course he'd do whatever he would have done anyway. But a, a great teacher, a great writer, and, and just taught me a lot about, early on, I didn't know about it then, what it means to be a judge. What it means to be thoughtful and neutral and, and run a courtroom, which is really the most important thing that judges do. Uh, you know, we like to think of, of we're a, a higher court than the district court, but it's really where, where justice is dispensed and where cases are tried and for better or worse records are made is the, is the trial court and a good trial judge makes an enormous difference. And I, I, I learned that. I also learned from him, very useful in practice later, that a trial judge makes maybe 100 decisions a day that an appellate court never sees. That's right. Uh, that's enough with this witness. Go on. I'll give you an extra week to file. I won't give you an extra week to file. I'll let this exhibit in. I won't let this exhibit in. I'll cut off your argument. And that so much of that depends on the professionalism of the lawyer, the reputation of the lawyer, and the, and the professionalism of the judge. And it's something you never learn in law school. I mean, you can, the best law schools, even with the best clinics, can't give you the kind of hands-on experience that clerking for a district judge gives. Uh, when I interview law clerks, and I, they, they often say to me, well, you know, what, What's the best clerkship? And I say, all the things being equal, well, a clerkship for a district judge is the best clerkship. Because you, clerking for me on the Court of Appeals, I think it's a lot of fun, but it's, you're, you're qualified for it because you're coming out of law school. You're not qualified to be a district court clerk uh, until you see what the judge does and how different it is than, than, than what you studied in law school. Uh, how few times you, you're really dealing with the rules of evidence as much as a judge saying, that's unfair, I'm not letting that in. <laughs> you are, it's true. Yeah, that's it's fair, I'll let that in. It's ultimately, my experience as a litigator is the judge's role is to, you know, obviously get the rules of evidence correct, but also make sure the decision and the, well, even that momentary decision leads to fairness. And that's ultimately the goal of every judge. I was uh, on the Federal Evidence Rules Committee and I've taught evidence and my friend Dan Capra, who's the, uh, advisor to the committee once said, and I agree with him, the most important rule of evidence is rule 403. Mm -hmm. The most important rule of evidence is to say, this is, more, this is unfair, this is too prejudicial, or this is very probative, we ought to let it in. And that's, where, you know, that's what a trial judge does most of the time in trial. Is this, a, how, is this evidence really relevant or is it too harmful uh, in, in ways that aren't relevant to the case? And so, Learning that right out of law, but a district court clerkship right out of law school was just a marvelous experience. And then I went to work for a, a very good court of appeals judge who was uh, just a, 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 you know, a very experienced. He was then a senior judge. He'd been a district judge before, and he knew everything. He knew everyone. And, um, and, and learning the sort of the greater detachment that he had from the cases. I mean, he was very zealous and he was um, cared about the cases, but the notion that you could step back and look at, at the case in a more clinical way and say, well, yeah, maybe the judge shouldn't have done this, but if I look at the case as a whole, does it make a difference, was also a wonderful experience. And then I got to clerk in the Supreme Court the year of the Nixon tapes case, uh, and so it's hard to think of a better time to be there or a better person to work for um, than Potter Stewart, who was just marvelous with his clerks and a, and, a, and, and a person who took every case one by one. 
he didn't he didn't walk into the courtroom you know in the way that some ideological judge might knowing how the case is going to come out before he started thinking about it he he really thought through each case and really thought of himself as a lawyer so he was a great person to work for and, and when you were clerking for um, associate justice Stewart, is there one particular case that you mentioned the Nixon tapes? Or is that well, the one that stood out? That's the one that, that dominated our year. Because you, you, if, if you may recall, you may not recall, but the, the Nixon's fight with with Judge Sirica and and the special prosecutor and the grand jury lasted for most of a year, and so we thought the case was coming up in the fall. It didn't. Uh, but we got ready for it coming up, and then it came up again at the very end of the year. And so we, we all the chambers were consumed with that case. Uh, Justice Stewart didn't write the opinion, but we were all heavily involved uh, in, in looking at drafts with him and, and, and going through stuff. Uh, so that's the case that if you think, it, it's funny, it's not a case where I did the draft of the opinions, and, or one where, that was my primary responsibility. But if you think back on that year at the court, it really dominated the court's uh, agenda, and it and it really put the court at the center of uh, you know our Republican democracy. Um, you know, whether we the, the executive branch basically facing off with the court, and you had uh, Nixon's lawyer saying at some point, "Well, we'll follow a definitive opinion of the court, but if it's not definitive, we may not follow it." Uh, and so, really, you know, amazing times. Um, and what a month after the court made its decision unanimously, the president resigned. Uh, so you really did feel like you were at the center of of all action at that point. Yeah. Well, part of a major, major aspect of American political history. That's yeah, sure. and, and and a minor part to be sure, but still a part. Well, I don't I mean, know how minor it was. The justices the the were major parts, and yes. we were sort of we were minor parts. But you know, they, the, and because it, it was also fascinating, because it was new ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people hadn't really thought seriously about what were the limits of executive power and how much did the court's ability to, to subpoena uh, conflict with that. And you can see those issues are still around. Judge Kavanaugh is going to be asked Absolutely. a lot about those issues, I think, no, it's a, it's in the coming weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it, was, it was new ground, so it was just fascinating stuff. And from there you went into private practice? Yeah, and, straight, and sort of a, this is another thing that your life happens to you, I think, in a series of, of, of things that you don't plan, which I always try to tell my clerks is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one young child, we had a, uh, well, almost three-year-old child, and one on the way. And my wife and I were pretty adamant that I didn't want to work anywhere we had to commute. Uh, I wanted to be home for dinner. I wanted to, uh, you know, find a practice where that didn't keep me out of the, you know, away from home all night. And so we started looking around. I had worked one summer in Phoenix and liked it, but hadn't really thought about going back there. One of Justice Rehnquist's clerks uh, was going back to this small firm in Phoenix, which turns out was made up of all ex-Supreme Court clerks at the wow. time. Um, at one point when I was there, we had 18 ex-Supreme Court clerks in this. Room. So they would come back every year and recruit. And he said, he said, you like Phoenix, talk to these guys. And we flew out there and, and decided that it might be a, a, a fun place to see if we could settle into the community and bought a house two miles from the office. Um, you know, and it was, Phoenix is still a place where in the center of the city you can you can live in a house, I mean, much like LA in that sense, although not spread out the way LA is. And, and the firm was fascinating. They were just starting and they were gonna do great things and they have done great things. A lot of pro bono emphasis, a lot of emphasis on getting into court and doing what you wanted to do. And I was the seventh person through the door. But I came out with two other Supreme Court clerks from Washington. So we, we were eight, nine, seven, eight, and nine in the firm. And, and we got to do great things. So it was a wonderful decision in terms of professional life. I was trying cases and arguing appeals. You know, I, I tried a case, I tried a felony, uh, defended a felony uh, robbery case a month after I was admitted to the bar, <laughs> uh, um, to a jury. So I had a wonderful education, great colleagues, and it turned out for reasons that I had 
not planned at all. That Phoenix was also a great place in terms of career. Um, I had known the a guy who was running for attorney general, Bruce Babbitt, who I'd met when I was in law school because he was recruiting for his firm. And when I got there, didn't become much involved in his campaign because it was that I arrived in August and the campaign was, but I knew everybody and I knew him. And after a few years, he said, I've got a case I want you to take for the attorney general's office and work with me on. And first of all, I was, then I was a business generator. <laughs> I had a big yeah. case. The state was paying me and they were good for it. Uh, so it was great for the firm and it was a great case. We were dealing with the racing industry. And after that, he kept asking me whether I would come join him and I kept saying, no, I want to be, I want to become a partner in my firm. I'm working on my craft. And in 1980, um, six years after I got there, and by then I was a partner, he asked me if I'd come and be his chief of staff. And at that point, he was governor. And I was afraid he wouldn't ask again if I didn't say yes. And so the firm, my firm was wonderful. They said, go do it. You'll come back when you're done. And I spent the next four years being Babbitt's chief of staff. Uh, and it's about as much fun as you can have in government um, legally. Uh, a small state, one where he was uh, very reform-minded, he was very forward-looking, he wanted to get Arizona into the Medicaid system, we'd never been into, Me we, we didn't have a Medicaid system, he wanted to reform the state land department, uh, he, he had wanted to do water law, where Arizona's really been a leader in, in water law. And, and, he, and we had this young staff. No, I was, you know, nobody over 40. Uh, he was just in his early 40s. And we just had a marvelous time. Just terrific. And I learned so much. And I also, I grew a lot in it. I mean, I got, was put in positions of real responsibility. I was negotiating bills with leaders of the legislature and going off to Washington to deal with, you know, the, the Reagan White House on federalism issues. Uh, just a terrific job, and Bruce Babbitt was, you know, was and well, now he's not in government, but as both as a governor and secretary of the interior, one of right. one of the great public servants of our time. He's now working part time for Jerry Brown, uh, trying to help Brown figure out what to, what legacy on the water side he's going to have. And California is where we were in Arizona 20 years ago, before we brought everybody in a room and shut the doors and said, we're not leaving until we have an agreement. Much different here. I'm not sure that the governor can pull that off. But uh, and then I went back to my firm. Um, and a few years, about a year later, we had a governmental crisis in Arizona. Uh, our governor was impeached. Yes, I remember that. Uh, Evan Meekham was impeached. And under Arizona's strange constitutional system, during the impeachment, the Secretary of State becomes the acting governor. Correct. But not the, you know, she's just the acting governor. And the Secretary of State was a dear friend of mine and an Arizona icon named Rose Mofford, mm -hmm. who is just a, just a pistol. Just, a, I mean, as, as, as colorful a public figure, but also a very thoughtful person, uh, as you could imagine. But they had no provision for staff. So she was going to become the acting governor. And she called me literally in the middle of the night and said, come to my house, there's reporters outside. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk to you. And I went there with, with another one of the ex-Babbitt aides. Uh, uh, and we, we went in and talked to her. And she said, can you help us? And we said, sure. We'll make some calls. We'll get a staff put together. And we literally had one of these sort of volunteer staffs. Nobody got paid. Six months of a volunteer staff, mostly, obviously, the ex-Babbitt people, but, but some younger folks who hadn't been involved before and got to, got to try to keep the Arizona state government together for six months until the impeachment proceedings were over. She was convicted, uh, he was convicted, she became the governor, and she was then able to hire a full-time staff. And most of us then said, we've done our service, we weren't getting paid, uh, we'll go back, you know, we'll go back to our regular lives and you can hire people and, and move on from here. Um, again, just one of these sort of unique opportunities you fall into and I fell into it because I was Babbitt's chief of staff, and he was out of town a lot. And when he was out of town, Mofford was the acting governor. Uh, and so I would always go down and say, the governor's going to be out of town tomorrow. I don't think anything important is going to happen. Here's the schedule of stuff. I'll call you if anything really requires your 
you know, you to be the acting governor, but he's in contact. I don't. And so she had always said, you know, well, Andy was in charge. So when, <laughs> when, when she needed somebody to help her be in charge, she gave me a call. Uh, so great, it was, you know, great fun. And um, she then appointed me to the Board of Regents in Arizona, another great opportunity, where I was eight years on that board, the governing of the state universities. Learned all sorts of stuff I didn't know before. Stuff I knew instinctively about the importance of higher education to, right. to both mobility of, of people in society and to the economic development of a state. And the way our board worked then was you moved through the positions, you became the president the last year. And so basically a full-time job the last year of it. Um, my colleagues at the law firm were also wonderful about that. And so I, I got that experience. Uh, and I, and I think you were a big advocate for making higher education, university available for you know, a broader variety of Yeah, people. and there, there are two ways that we, we thought about doing that. And one was, of course, by trying to control tuition. Um, and that's been harder and harder as the state contributions to, to higher education have gone down. The other way was thinking aggressively about diversifying universities. And, and Less, think, uh, less in terms of affirmative action than saying there's lots of people out there who can do this work who may not have had the appropriate background mm -hmm. or we may not have sought them out appropriately. And uh, I was certainly on the board with this wonderful corporate executive named Jack Feaster who when we went into this gave a wonderful piece of advice. He said, whatever we measure will improve. That's what I've learned in business. You want something to get better, you measure it. And then people will meet the measurements. So our measurement was, we want you to increase um, enrollment by, of underrepresented groups by 10% a year. And we want their retention rate to be equal to or better than the other populations. And then we said to the universities, you figure out how to do it. Uh, we have some measures we'd like you to look at, but they're outcome measures. Uh, we don't, we're not going to tell you how to work it in the meantime. And they got called the Hurwitz measures, which was kind of mm -hmm. cool. And they met them. And so the, the system, while not perfect now, is, is much more representative of the population. And there's all sorts of great implications that come out of that. Uh, so I was proud of that time. It was, it was great fun. Yeah, and then I think next to you, I mean, obviously you went back into private practice, or you were in private uh, practice yeah. at that time. But then somehow you met Janet Napolitano. Well, I'd known Janet for a long time along the way because she was recruited to, she began, Mary Schroeder's law clerk. Mm -hmm. Then she, she went to work for the firm of Lewis and Roca, where one of, my, one of my mentors, John Frank, uh, who I'd worked for a summer that I was there, was there, and she did appellate work, which is, so we worked in the same circles. Mm -hmm. And we were both, in those days, involved in Democratic Party politics, and so we knew each other from that stuff, and I knew I followed with some interest and some pride Janet's career. She went from U.S. Attorney to Attorney General to the Governor of Arizona, and worked with her a little bit along the way. Um, somewhere, I guess it was like 2000, I don't remember the year, but somewhere along the way, uh, a bunch of people came to me and said, would you take over this capital case? Uh, which we think might go to the U.S. Supreme Court, which turned out to be Ring versus Arizona. So I took over that case and we, we filed for cert. And when it was granted, I called Janet and said, you ought to argue. I'm going to argue this case. You ought to argue the other side. It's going to be the only time you're ever going to have a chance to go to the Supreme Court because, you know, you're, you're going to run for governor next year and be elected. And she said, yeah, I will. And I said, so we won't socialize for the next several months. We'll just, you know, we'll only talk about the case. And we did. We argued the case against each other. Uh, I think I had the better side. Mm -hmm. you know, the you court had the winning thought, side. The court <laughs> thought I had the better side. She did a great job, I must say. And we had this great experience where we then all went to dinner. The only time I think both sides of a Supreme Court argument went to dinner together. All the Arizona lawyers went to dinner together. John Frank hosted it. We had a wonderful time. and. Um, and she asked if I would, you know, help in the gubernatorial campaign. And I said, sure. And I helped her with debates and stuff along the way. And when she got elected, she asked me if I would run her transition. And I said, I will, but I have to tell you, I'm interested in being on the Arizona Supreme Court. 
Uh, and the way our system works is the commission nominates people to the governor. I had actually applied the year before when there was a Republican governor, been sent up to her and not chosen. But I did it because I anticipated that a Democrat might win the election later. And this way I would have been through the commission and they would be familiar with me. And, it, and so when I applied again, they sent my name up to her. And I said during the transition, I, I don't want to disqualify myself for this. You know, so if you don't think it looks good for me, and she said, no, you know me well enough to know that I'll be independent in making this decision. And in fact, she made me sweat when <laughs> my name went up because of another very good lawyer, Scott Bales, now the Chief Justice of Arizona. Another one of my former law partners was sent up with me, and she could have quite rationally chosen Scott ahead of me, but she didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I then began this career on the other side of the bench, and having done lots and lots of appeals, and I thought it was at about the right time in my career to do this. I'd done a lot of stuff in private practice. I'd had lots of great experiences. And I had an experience being a neutral. I had an experience being on the side where, you're not a, where you don't know in advance who's right because you don't, somebody's not paying you. Uh, and so I, I thought this would be a, a great experience. And again, by happenstance, it turned out to be a wonderful experience. The Arizona Supreme Court in those days uh, Scott Bales was the next nominee, so he, he eventually joined us. We had three former Supreme Court clerks out of the five justices, a, a law school professor in Rebecca Birch, who later became the Chief Justice, and Mike Ryan, the smartest and most able prosecutor and trial and appellate judge I ever met. And we just, we had great conferences. Everybody's work got better because of the other people there. And I was having a wonderful time. Uh, and, and you had a number of uh, pretty interesting cases, too, while you were on the Arizona Supreme Court. Is one that stands out more well, than others? Well, you know, I think the one that's, the, the, the couple that stand out are the ones that involved most high-profile stuff with the other branches of government. Mm -hmm. I mean, early on, after Governor DiPaolo came on, we actually held that she had exceeded her powers in, in one area. Uh, when she appointed me, I said, you know, I'm going to make you unhappy at some point along the way. We made her unhappy earlier, early. We then, uh, we later on uh, had a case involving our independent uh, electoral commission in, in which the legislature had tried to remove the head of the commission and we held that they could not. And, and those kinds of cases that involve tugs with the other branches of government are the ones that most stand out. But the most fun cases for me were the cases where I was learning something I didn't know something about before. Uh, great thing about being a litigator is you have new, a new challenge every time. Great thing about being an appellate judge is you have a new challenge and it goes away every three months. <laughs> you hear it, you decide it, and you move on to something else. And, and so immersing yourself into areas that you didn't know much about, whether they're tort or contract or criminal law, uh, and, and trying to solve problems with the other four people together uh, was really just, you know, a lot of fun. And plus, in Arizona, the Supreme Court runs the judicial system. So we all had roles that were different than our judicial roles. I was head of the information technology thing. So we were trying to reform, uh, we did e-filing in the states. So we, we have universal e-filing in Arizona now, mm -hmm. even in the even in the rural counties. It's something I worked on for years while I was there. And of uh, course, we, that's come to pass in the meantime. Yeah, and it's come to pass. Uh, and so th there were there were there were roles in the administration of justice that you had wholly apart from being a decision maker. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 I and I had some experience in in bureaucracies and, and in state government. Just so a I, little. So it was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was fun to do that stuff too. And we also had the continual fending off of attacks on the Arizona merit system. Uh, legislature continually wanted to return to elections, understandably because they were elected. <laughs> and they viewed us as politicians and not as judges. And very hard to keep educating the legislature every year that our, our role was different, that whatever our political affiliation was before we became judges, we didn't decide things the way they decided them. And, and, and because of term limits in the legislature, it's a continual process. You used to have experienced people there who understood that. Now you have people come in, stay for four years, and leave. And you had a, we had a 
a lot of lobbying involved, which I didn't expect to be part of the job. Yeah, and at some point, uh, you transitioned to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. Yeah, and, uh, and again, so I had been interested in a federal judgeship when Clinton was in the White House, and it proceeded along fairly far. Uh, I, don't think this, I think this is not a secret. And, and, um, but it fell apart because of uh, political opposition from one of the home state senators. Uh, when I was on summer vacation in California, sitting at the beach, when I got a call from Senator Kyle, who said, there's a Ninth Circuit position open, would you be interested in it? This was Judge Schroeder had indicated she was going to go senior. And I said, well, yes and no. Uh, Arizona has a retirement age. I'd be interested in it because I think I could stay longer and I'd also have both sets of experiences. But I don't want to get caught up in a big Senate fight. I'm too late in my career for that. And I'm very happy in this job. So if you think it's going to be controversial. And he said, look, I'm in favor of you and the White House is in favor of you. What could be the problem? <laughs> I'm the number two guy in the Senate uh, Republican majority and the White House is well, if the White House is in favor of you, you know, it'll be easy. I said, sure. And I was nominated very quickly. Uh, Senator Kyle tried to set up a hearing right away in December, but the Senate was then moving one circuit judge at a time. And by the time I got a hearing, it was February or March. The hearing was perfectly uneventful. Uh, only two senators, as is normally the case, Senator Kyle and Senator Durbin, a lot of a lot of non-controversial questions. And on the way out, Senator Carl said to me, you know, there's this article you wrote once about Judge Newman, and some, some people have some trouble with it. And I, had, I still think the article is completely unremarkable. It was biographical about Judge Newman, but it was biographical about a, an abortion case. And, and as I soon learned in DC, that becomes a big deal. And so all of a sudden, there was opposition and uh, people uh, on um, all entirely on the Republican side. And to his credit, Senator Carl, who had talked me into this, said, we'll get you through this. But we had to go through a, uh, a cloture vote. Uh, and I was watching it on TV with my law clerks. And uh, there were up to 58 votes to, to invoke cloture. You need 60. And they were there for a long time. And I said, and I get a phone call from Senator Kyle, who's on the floor of the Senate, saying, uh, the problem is uh, Senators Boxer and one other missed their flights. Oh. They'll be here shortly. As soon as they get here, we'll get to 60. And he did. Uh, and he did through calling. Senator McCain was very supportive, too. And between the two of them, they had enough friends in, in the Senate to, who, who thought that this wasn't this was a tempest in a teapot. And so they did that. And then the next day, I was confirmed by a voice vote. So I'd like to say I was unanimous. <laughs> uh, and when I got here, uh, Richard Pius said to me something that I've always remembered. He said, it doesn't matter what the vote was. Once you get here, you're, everybody is like everyone else. And you, and you do your job without respect to how you got here. Uh, and I think that was very good advice. Uh, so I was happy to, you know, it was wonderful to happen. I was sad to go through that experience because I think our process now is, has broken down on both sides. Become it, very, very political. Very political, very personal. Um, people say things they don't believe. Um, and, 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 and also because circuit judge votes have now become scoring votes for interest groups. So if you vote yes on someone, you get a lower rate from an interest group. And I had all that explained to me in this process. Some by very nice Republican senators who said, you'll be confirmed, don't worry about it, but I have to vote against you because I will be graded on this vote. Uh, but who said, but I'll vote for cloture because I can, I can, nobody will grade me on the cloture vote because I can say I, I'm always for an up or down vote on people and by God I voted no. Uh, it's just, we, the process has become difficult I, th I fear at some point it's going to scare off able people from going through it. And it's become irrational. I went in, uh, I've known Richard Toronto, who's a judge on the, on the uh, federal circuit now for a long time. We went for our White House interview the same day, uh, chatted on the way in and out. Uh, he was nominated one day later than I, simply because of paperwork. He got his stuff in one day later. Uh, 
He was confirmed 370 days later than I because I was the last person confirmed in the 2012 Senate. And then, of course, a new Senate was, came in in 2013, so they had to renominate him and he had to go, go through the process again. He was confirmed 99 to 0. Uh, not the way we should be running the railroad, but um, the process has broken down in many ways. It's remarkable that we still get very good people, but I fear at some point, on both sides, I just fear at some point it's, it's going to discourage people, particularly people in private practice, who, for whom the monetary loss of the uncertainty is really great, from wanting to, to engage in this kind of public service. Well, I couldn't agree more. So we're a little short on time, but I did want to ask you about um, an Arizona Law Review article you wrote that got a very wide distribution about uh, yeah, judges and, and, admitting so, mistakes. So here's what happened. Um, it, it arose out of a tragedy. My, one of my first law clerks, Mark Hummels, who had become a very close friend and went off to my old law firm, was murdered in Phoenix on his way out of a mediation. And the Arizona Law Review decided that they were going to do a, an ethics thing dedicated to Mark, a lot of whose career was around professional responsibility. And I, of course, volunteered and said, yeah, I have to write something for you no idea what I was going to write. Uh, and then what happened was the Supreme Court was in the middle of revising opinions without saying why they were revising them. They made errors. They weren't just scrivener's errors. I mean, there were substantive things being changed. And it struck me that we weren't very transparent as a judicial branch about this. And so I started thinking about, you know, mea culpa. <laughs> And, uh, and really went back into my sort of personal experience and, and, and decided it might be fun to say that judges should admit when they're wrong. Uh, and got, got put this, this little piece together and I thought it would just be my friends in Arizona would see it. And it, for some reason it got national recognition. Uh, and uh, and I, think, I think to the good. I still don't see you know, many courts doing it, but one thing we've begun to insist on is when we amend an opinion, if it's not just an amendment that says we cited the wrong case or there's a cert denied here, we ought to do a little order with it that says we're amending this opinion because we've now discovered or we've learned that or somebody's filed a supplemental brief bringing something to our attention. We still think it comes out the same way but acknowledging that we've changed it. Uh, and it's not a universal practice but I think it's something we should be doing. I think we should, you know, we're, uh, it, it worries me a lot in general that we don't acknowledge our fallibility and so we treat and we say, well, he got a fair trial and he was convicted and therefore he must have done it. And the truth is, it's a, it's a predictive mechanism. Uh, it's probably right much, you know, 98% of the time. But there's error in all systems and, and if we pretend there is an error, in our systems, I think it leads to it leads to public policy that's not good results. So we ought to be we ought to be honest about when we make mistakes, and we all make them. Uh, we make you know hopefully one of the nice things about a collegial process having three people is you make fewer mistakes because other people catch them, and we have six good lawyers, three three judges, and three law clerks on every case, but we're still going to make them, and we ought to be honest when we do. And we ought to be able to correct them when we do. Uh, so that, that was, and, and was it something, again, I hadn't really thought about. I just had to write an article. <laughs> and I was sitting around with my law clerk saying, so what's interesting in this area? And we said, look what the Supreme Court's just recently done. Maybe we can talk about that. Uh, so that, well, that started a did. real dialogue across the country. So it was very useful. Yeah, no, it was, it was very, I got calls from people and, uh, uh, and you know, and I said, "Look, I'm proud of the Arizona Law Review, but it's not a, a general circulation publication. So, for some reason, the title or some other reason, people picked it up, and it, it it's gotten some it's gotten some uh, longevity." Absolutely. So, unfortunately, we're out of time. But if there's anything else we didn't cover that you'd like to mention before we sign off, no, I mean, about look, the I, I, the one thing I think I should say is is this is a great job. Um, and being a judge is a great job. I mean, you get to 
deal with interesting people and interesting cases. And, and, and the hard part about it, it seems to me, is to remember that real people underlie almost every case and that what they expect out of you is, is neutrality and equal application of the law. Mm -hmm. And some, sometimes you just get carried away with how much fun or how interesting something is. And the hard part is sort of taking that step back and looking at the case from 30,000 feet and saying, does it make sense? Are we doing the right thing? Are we following the law? Are we acting as judges and not as legislators or as jurors? And those are the hard parts of the job. And, but the fun parts of the job much outweigh them. So it's a great opportunity to, that, that I've been given. And I'm just very grateful that I have it. Thank you so much for your time, Your Honor. Thank really you. I appreciate it.